needs to be louder. Louder. We can. Better? That's better. Okay. Um, it's uh, great to be with you. I am uh, a Floridian. A lawyer. So I can tell you a lawyer story and a far story. So <clears throat> the lawyer stories, as you may have heard on the internet, that uh, Al Qaeda announced that they have kidnapped 100 lawyers. And they said if the United States doesn't get out of Afghanistan within 14 days, they're going to begin releasing the lawyers. Talk about one for 100 days. <laughs> so here, here's my Florida story. I come from uh, Naples, Florida. Uh, everything, in, every story in Florida has got uh, old age and the average age in Naples is deceased. <laughs> this is a story about a group of guys that resolved that this started when they were middle aged. They resolved they were going to meet every 10 years in Naples for a reunion. It all started when they were 40 years old. They got together and they voted on where to go to dinner and they decided to go to dinner at the Ritz Carlton because the waitresses there were very attractive and they wanted to lock it out there. Ten years go by and they're 50 years old, they get together for their second and meet their brother. And they decide once again to go to dinner at the Ritz Carlton because the food and the wine there is really spectacular. Fast forward another decade, they're 60 years old, and they get together and vote, and they decide to go to dinner at, at the Ritz Carlton because it's quiet there and sedate, you hear yourself talk. Another decade goes by, they're 70 years old, they get together, they vote, they decide to go to dinner at the Ritz Carlton because it has uh, elevators and wheelchair access. And then just a few weeks ago, they turned 80 years old and they got together and voted and decided to go to dinner at the Ritz Carlton because they had never been there before. <laughs> <laughs> now, for folks my age, that's getting to be a little close to uh, reality. Now, today, I'm, I'm going to talk about DCV Heller and some follow-on uh, uh, cases. Uh, as you may know, DCB Heller was the successful Second Amendment challenge to the DC gun ban. I was co-counsel with Mr. Heller in that case. Um, so let, let me begin with this uh, common sense statement. And that is that killers who aren't deterred by laws against murder are very unlikely to be deterred by laws against uh, carrying guns. And so the any gun regulations that we had and still have in many cities and districts and municipalities don't address the deep root causes of violent crime. I'm talking about things like illegitimacy, uh, unemployment, uh, dysfunctional schools, drug abuse, and alcohol abuse. So the, the cures for these problems are, of course, complicated and protracted. But that doesn't mean that while we're waiting on these cures, we have a fine these cures, uh, that we have to become passive prey for a criminal predator. So we're sure to policy. Uh, there's a pretty compelling argument to be made that Americans deserve an opportunity uh, to defend themselves by possessing a uh, suitable firearms. But even if the policy argument were to cut the other way, that is to say, even if you could demonstrate, and I want to hasten to add that I don't believe you can, even if you could demonstrate that more gun laws uh, lead to less crime, uh, this is not just about policy. Uh, this is about the meaning of the Constitution, and of course, in particular, uh, the meeting of the uh, Second Amendment. And happily, on June 26, 2008, uh, the highest court in the country uh, ruled that the Constitution forecloses an outright ban on handguns, which is what they had in Washington, D.C. And what that means is that if we Americans decide, and I believe if we did so, we would be mistaken in having decided this, so if we decide that a ban like they had in D.C. is required uh, for public safety, the remedy is to go change the Constitution. You cannot simply ignore the Constitutional provision and act as though the document uh, didn't exist. As a nation, we've chosen to have a written Constitution for good reason. It has served us very well for more than uh, two centuries. And so we have to consider not just the policy question, but the relationship between gun laws on the one hand and public safety on the other. We have to consider the constitutional question question that divided Second Amendment scholars for many decades, and that is, does the right to keep and bear arms belong to an individual, or does the Constitution really recognize the collective right of the states to arm the members of their, uh, of their militia? In 1939, the Supreme Court had a chance uh, to resolve that question in a case called United States uh, versus Miller, and the challenge statutes required the registration of uh, of machine guns, sawed-off rifles, sawed-off shotguns, and silence. Um, regrettably, the court did 
very little to illuminate, not too much to mystify, uh, the meaning of the Second Amendment. And the justice who wrote the opinion, uh, James Clark and Reynolds, it was riddled with uh, ambiguities and established no definitive uh, legal principle uh, or useful guidelines for any modern Second Amendment uh, deliberation. It's a very interesting case. So the, the facts are quite extraordinary. In Miller, two mobsters, Jack Miller and Frank Blakes, were indicted uh, for knowingly transporting a sawed-off shotgun across uh, state lines in violation of the 1934 uh, National Firearms Act, which required the registration of weapons like sawed-off shotguns in the of a very substantial tax. So neither Miller nor Layton was charged uh, with firing the gun or committing any crime involving the use of the gun. Instead, they were indicted for a technical violation uh, of the registration and tax requirements uh, they challenged the indictment, arguing that it violated their Second Amendment rights, and they won in the lower court. So the United States, the losing party, appealed this case and went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and there's where the fun began. Because in the United States Supreme Court, Mr. Miller's attorney, now mind you, I'm talking about a case in 1939 that became the seminal Second Amendment case all the way up to 2008 in Hellenism. 1939, the United States versus Miller goes to the Supreme Court, and Miller's attorney, that in Paul Goops, sends the Supreme Court uh, a telegram. He doesn't file a brief, he doesn't show up for oral argument, and his clients don't show up for oral argument. He sends the Supreme Court a telegram, quote, I suggest the case be submitted on the government's brief. Now, the government is imposed on rights. <laughs> Unable to obtain any money from clients to be present and argue that. Case. The seminal Second Amendment case was argued with only one party present and only one attorney present representing the United States. Quite extraordinarily, the, the, the court did nothing to reschedule the case or to appoint a different lawyer but for Mr. Miller. And then Justice McReynolds produced this, this muddled opinion and its confused lawyers and law students and, uh, and the public for many decades. So when it was all over, the Supreme Court had reversed the lower court's holding. Uh, that the National Firearms Act violated the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court held that the National Firearms Act did not violate the Second Amendment, and the case was remanded for a new trial of Miller and Blake. But before the trial could be conducted, Miller was shot and killed by detention. Blake agreed to a plea bargain and sentenced to five years uh, on probation, but the damage to the Second Amendment uh, has already been, uh, been done. So how should this Second Amendment be interpreted? Well, there are two clauses that you know. The main clause, the right of the people to keep their arms shall not be infringed. I don't know what can be clearer than that. The right shall not be infringed. That defines the right and secures the right. But there is this troublesome preparatory subordinate clause, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security uh, of a free state. What's its purpose? Its purpose is to help explain why it is that we have this right. Not the only reason you have the right, but one reason, and that is to provide for the efficient operation of a militia. That's one reason among others. And so it is fair to say that membership in a well-regulated militia is a sufficient but not necessary condition to the exercise of your second amendment right. If you are a member of a well-regulated militia, it's quite clear that you have a right to bear arms. But that's not the requirement. That is one rationale for that right. Others would include, for example, the right to defend yourself, or the right to hunt, to provide food for your, your family. So imagine if the Second Amendment said this, and you'll hear that the syntax here is just about identical to what the Second Amendment actually says. Suppose the Second Amendment said, a well-educated elector uh, being necessary to self-government in the free state. The right of the people to keep these books shall not be framed. Now, would anybody interpret that to mean that only registered voters, that is, the members of the well-educated electorate, have a right to vote? Uh, surely not. And yet that is exactly the interpretation that the collective rights advocates uh, are proposing for their second amendment, applying the second amendment right only to members of the well regulated uh, militia. If the second amendment uh, truly meant what the collective rights advocates intended it means, then the language would be much more straightforward. It would say a well regulated militia being necessary to the security of the free state, the right of the state to harm the members of their militia shall not be included. Of course, it does not 
say that. He says the right of the people. And that's the same term. It's a term of art. It's the same term that you will find in the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Ninth Amendment, the Tenth Amendment. Five of the Ten Amendments in the Bill of Rights use this term, uh, the people. And of course, the Bill of Rights itself is the section of the Constitution that deals with the rights of the people. So it's quite clear that First Amendment rights, for example, like speech and religion, press, belong to us as individuals. Ditto for Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable searches. That's an individual right. Similarly, uh, the Second Amendment, uh, we secure the right of the people by guaranteeing the right of each and every uh, individual person. Some say the Second Amendment uh, were intended for the state. Indeed, it was not only not intended for the state, it was intended, this is agreed upon across the ideological spectrum, intended in part as protection against the state. Protection against the possibility of a tyrannical uh, government. Now, if you look at the Constitution, you'll find out that the militia is under the plenary control of the U.S. federal government. So imagine that you have a right that is designed in major part to be a deterrent against government and tyranny. And that right could only be exercised in the context of a militia which is controlled by the very government that has the potential of being tyrannical. Now, this is not a right in any sense uh, of deterrent. That's not a right exercisable only when, where, and how the government permits that it could possibly be a deterrent against a government tyranny. Now, there, there are some folks who would argue, I think I would agree, that the threat of a tyrannical government is certainly not zero, but it could be less uh, than it was at the time of the training. But uh, the government's inability to defend us against uh, foreign and domestic predators remains a serious problem. And the demand for police or army to defend us, it increases in proportion to our inability uh, to defend ourselves. And that's why you'll find this armed society pretending to become police states. And you don't have to look very far to find that. Uh, I could look where I grew up in, in uh, the inner city of Washington, D.C., where the hell a case uh, was, litig uh, was litigated. And there you will find law-abiding inner city residents uh, who are begging, disarmed by gun control regulations, and they are begging uh, for police protection, mostly against the uh, drug gang. Despite the terrible violation of civil liberties that this kind of police protection frequently entails, I'm talking about things like curfews, loitering laws, um, if you're putting public housing, non consensual searches uh, of your home, uh, civil asset uh, forfeiture, even video surveillance in, uh, in high crime uh, areas. So, an unarmed citizenry it creates uh, the conditions that could potentially lead. Uh, the tyranny. So in that sense, the right to bear arms uh, is prevented. It reduces the demand for police because we're able uh, to defend ourselves. When the people are incapable of protecting themselves, then either they're going to be dependents on the state or they're going to become victims of the crime. Um, interestingly, there are a lot of scholars and most including some uh, on the left, uh, who agree that the Second Amendment does secure an individual right, although it can be limited in some circumstances. So here's Harvard's uh, Alan Dershowitz, a former member of the ACLU, and, uh, ACLU board member, rather, and he says, and I quote, I hate them. I want the Second Amendment repealed. But then he goes on to say, I condemn foolish liberals who are trying to read the Second Amendment uh, out of the Constitution by claiming it's not an individual right. They're courting disaster by encouraging others to use the same means to eliminate those portions of the Constitution that they don't happen to like. 